Hello and welcome to the next episode in my Blender tutorial series. I'm really excited about this one because we're talking about one of my favorite topics, geometry nodes. This is something that I've been doing a whole lot on stream recently, so that's probably no surprise to anyone who's been there. In the last episode, we used shader nodes in order to make this material here, and we're going to use a lot of the things we learned there, particularly the node wrangler shortcuts, to help develop an understanding of geometry nodes today. As a quick reminder of those shortcuts, you can hold shift and right click in order to drag across a noodle and cut it. You can hold alt and right click in order to connect two things. You can use shift D in order to duplicate a node. You can use shift control right click drag in order to combine two nodes in a way that makes sense contextually, whether that's to mix them like a color or to mix them like a shader. You can also control shift left click on a node in order to preview it. As always, if you'd like to support me in making this content, consider joining my Patreon, link in the description below. Let's get started. Let's clear our workspace. I'm gonna twirl these in, turn this off. Let's go ahead and make a new collection. We're going to be making a riveted seal. Let me give myself a little more room. To start, we're just going to create the base of the seal called the flange. So to do that, we'll create a cylinder. Let me go into solid mode. We're gonna scale this in on the Z. I'll apply the scale. I'll go into edit mode. I'll select the top and the bottom in face mode. One and two. I'll hit I to inset. I'll delete these faces. I'll go into edge mode, select this loop and this loop, right click, bridge edge loops. That looks good to me. We can edit this further if we need to. We'll right click, click shade smooth, and we'll set the angle to 30 degrees here. That'll be fine. That will mean we have a nice sharp edge here, but these faces on the side are nice and smooth. Okay, let's add some modifiers. Click on the modifiers tab. You'll notice we have a smooth by angle modifier here. This replaces the old shade smooth system and makes it a little more explicit. As a side note, if you're watching other tutorials and they simply right click shade smooth, they won't have a modifier like this, but this lets us edit this number. Like if I said 91, you'll notice the whole thing becomes smooth and kind of horrible. Let's undo that quickly. Ah, that's better. Anyways, just be aware. Let's add in another modifier. This time it'll be a bevel. This is beveling way too much. Let's bring that down and let's give ourselves three cuts. I can see I'm getting a little bit of tearing here. Let's actually add five and now it's nice and smooth. As you can see, we have two modifiers here and with that, we're now ready to add some geometry nodes. The best way to make sense of geo nodes is to think of it as a modifier because that's exactly what it is. You can add it in two ways. You can click on add modifier type in geometry nodes, or for me, I just have it as my first option here. I'm not quite sure how that shows up there. Anyway, the other, and for me, more common way of doing this is to set this as a geonodes editor. That's right here. Give myself a bit more space here. Zoom out a bit. And then I'm going to click on new. This will automatically add a modifier right here, and it'll give me some nodes to work with. Let me zoom in here. As you can see, it's added a geometry nodes modifier right here. Do note that this window will display only the one that's selected here. So if you click off of this, You'll notice that this vanishes. Don't worry, it's still there. Just click on this to get it back. You also might note that this little symbol here suggests that the smooth by angle is also a geometry nodes modifier. And indeed, if you click on it, you can see what it did here. Don't worry if you don't understand this. I'm only pointing this out because it's kind of a cool point of consistency. Anyways, let's get back to here and let me explain how this works. To best understand this, think about the way modifiers are laid out. That is conceptually, geometry comes in from the top, it's processed by the modifier, and then processed geometry comes out the bottom only to go into the next one, and then the next one, so on and so forth. This is more or less the same thing. The only difference here is direction. For geometry nodes, we have input coming in from the group input node here. It's processed by whatever we're going to do here, and then it goes to the output. In this case, it's simply going straight through, so nothing is happening, but it also means we can see this. If we unconnect this, you'll notice it disappears entirely. That's because the input here isn't making it to the output. This is very similar to what happened with shader nodes. I swapped the shader nodes for a second. We started with some inputs, numbers, colors, textures with coordinates, that kind of thing. It got processed, and then at the very end, it went to the output. It's the same over here, but instead of dealing with how these things get rendered, this deals with the geometry itself. The best way I think to understand this is to just see it in action. So to that end, I'm just gonna show you the process of me putting the rivets in here. To start, I'm going to make a circle. I'll hit Shift A, and I can actually just start typing. I'm going to type mesh circle. I'm also going to turn snapping on. There we go. Now, if I put this in, you can see I get a circle just like I would expect. 
Don't worry about the original geometry, we'll see it again soon. This node also gives me some options. I've got the fill type, which I can say either give me nothing, an n-gon, or some triangles. I don't need any of these right now, we'll leave it on none. The vertices I'm going to set to eight. And as you can see up here, I now have an octagon. You'll see why I did that in a second. For the radius, I'm going to leave this at one meter for right now, but I'll adjust this later. The reason I needed eight points here is because I'm going to spawn a rivet on each one of them. To do this, I'll use an instance on points node. I'll hit shift A, instance on points, and I'll simply drag drop this in here. And you'll notice it disappeared. The reason why is because we need to actually give this an instance. In the points socket, I'm giving it the mesh from the mesh circle. This has eight verts, and the instance on points node is more or less using those as a location to put instances. It just doesn't have anything yet. Let me zoom in. All an instance is, is a copy of geometry, something that lives in memory only once, that can be placed or instantiated around your scene as often as you want, while taking up fewer computer resources to do so. To show you this in action, let me add an icosphere. You'll also notice that I only need to start typing here. Oftentimes you'll be able to see the one you're looking for show up pretty quickly. The options here allow me to change the radius and give it some subdivisions. We'll see what that looks like in a second. But I'm going to take this mesh output and connect it to the instance here. And you'll notice, well, this happens. This is not what we're looking for. Let's go ahead and bring the radius down. I'll click, hold shift and drag. Something like that will be fine. You'll also notice I have a subdivisions option here. I'll set this to three. Honestly, this is probably a bit overkill, but because this is such a small amount of geo in the first place, this isn't so bad. Just be aware that subdivisions is one of those magic sliders that can actually hang Blender. That's true here or any of the other modifiers that use it. The reason is that it typically increases the amount of geometry you have exponentially. If you're curious to see how bad it is, you can go over to your overlays menu here, click on statistics, and now you can see over here I have 320 triangles. Increase this to four, you'll notice it goes to a thousand. And if I go to five, it starts increasing pretty quickly. So for right now, we'll leave this at three. Next, let's add back in the geometry that we had to start with. To do that, we'll use one of the keystrokes from earlier. Control, shift, right click, drag. And what that does is it gives us a join geometry node. You can, of course, just add this. It's in the menu right here. You'll also notice that it's rounded. All that means is that it's been twirled in. If you twirl it out, it looks like this. But what this does is it allows you to simply combine geometries without actually doing some kind of complicated Boolean. That is, all the mesh data from here and all the mesh data from here just get combined into a single object here with perhaps a bunch of meshes, otherwise known as mesh islands, and that gets passed through to the output. Okay, now you can see the rivets are not quite how they need to be. Let's go ahead and fix this. I'm gonna change the radius of the mesh circle, which will draw them in, and I'm gonna make them smaller. I'll spread it out a little bit more. In fact, let me look at this from above. I'll hit seven, and that actually looks pretty good. That looks fine to me. Let me move this up a bit. To do that, what I'll do is I'll actually do a transform geometry. And I'll pop that in here. You'll notice that when you do that, it automatically pushes the other nodes out further. What this allows us to do is to translate, rotate, or scale whatever gets passed into it. In this case, it's the whole group of instances all at once. What I'll do here is I'll move this up. And once more, I'll make it a little bit smaller. Bring it up a little bit more. And that looks good to me. Now, it doesn't have to be perfect. As you can see, you've got all these values here, and you can really dial in exactly the look you want for the thing you're trying to make. To finish this out, there are some things we need to do. You may notice that the instances are faceted and the rest of this isn't. It might seem very odd, because if you look at the modifier stack, the geometry nodes are happening, and then the smooth by angle is happening, which should mean that these get smoothed, right? I'm not entirely sure why they don't. One of the problems I have with geometry nodes is that the flow of data is a bit opaque. For right now, we'll have to settle for a workaround. In order to shade it smooth here, we're actually going to have to use a shade smooth node. So I'll go ahead and add this in here. I don't want to add it after here or here because this is already smooth and I simply want to make these things smooth. And as you can see, it's working just fine. Let me bring this down a little and let's look through the camera. So normally this is not what we would want for a finished product. I mean, of course we could have it laying flat, but the icon that I showed earlier has it sort of tilted to the side. So let's do that. There's two major ways I can do this. First, of course, I can just move this whole thing however I want, or we could use geometry nodes for this. To do that, we would grab this transform geometry, hit shift D to make another one, and I can put it in a noodle here, but let's think about which noodle we would want. I'll just set it right there for the moment. We don't wanna put it in this line here because this will just move the input geometry. Instead, I would wanna put it here in between the join geometry here and the output geometry node, and that's because it'll move the whole thing up. So I'll add it in. 
And as you can see, it's moved. The problem is that while that's actually not a terrible solution, I can of course rotate it and I can scale it up. This will work, but there are some things you wanna be aware of if you wanna do it this way. First off, you're kind of crossing the streams. That is to say, you have these nodes here, which are designed to put rivets on the thing, and this node here, which essentially poses the whole thing. It's fine to do, especially if you only mean this to be a single use thing. However, if you wanna make this more general, and we'll see some of that in a moment, then you probably wanna decouple making the rivets and posing it. And that's what we'll do for now. To get rid of this, I'll simply hit Control X. That will remove it, but it'll also leave the noodle in place. If I didn't use that, and instead just hit X, it'll sever the connection, and I generally don't want that. The other way of doing this comes with its own concerns. If I scale this up, it looks fine until I go to apply the scale. Now, why did that happen? Well, think of it this way. When I scaled this up, it also scaled this radius up with it. When I applied the scale, it got rid of the multiplier, which means it also stopped multiplying this 0.08 by that multiplier, meaning that this shrank. Let me undo. Another way of seeing why that happened would be to go into edit mode, hit A, and you'll note I'm only selecting the things that were made outside of geometry nodes. I can't select this geometry because it hasn't been made by the geometry nodes yet. If I scale this up, you kind of see why these wouldn't come along for the ride. They never got the multiplier for that scale in the first place. All that means is that if we want to keep our scale 1, 1, 1, which we probably do considering we have a bevel, we just need to go into our geo nodes and fix the knobs we have here. That'll be just fine right there. Now I can rotate this to position. And that looks fine to me. The last thing I'll do for this part right now is just to set a material. I'll go here and I'll say brass. And we can see a few things. First, we have no lighting, which we can fix in a minute, but also our rivets don't have any material. Now, why is that? The reason is because it didn't know what material to give it. I don't know why Blender doesn't assume that the material here isn't the one we should use by default, but for whatever reason, it doesn't. It applies only to the meshes that were generated outside of the geometry nodes network. In order to fix that, all I have to do is move these out, add a set material node, put it in here, and then I can simply select material here just the same way I selected the material here. I'll just click, I see brass, and there we go. I'll go ahead and set things up for some basic lighting. We've done this a few times, so I'm going to edit it down so it goes pretty quick. I should probably name this. Make another collection here, call it lighting. I'll add a plane. For the moment, I'll go to solid mode, make this big, rotate it, move it into place here. Actually, I'll have it coming down from above, something like that. I'll go ahead and give it a new material, give it a name. Let's bring this into the shader nodes. Let's head back to rendered mode, open up a mission. I'll give myself a color ramp. I'll plug the output of my color ramp into the input from my emission here. I'll give this a strength of one. I'll then click this and hit control T. It's going to give me an image texture in addition to the texture coordinates and the mapping node. I don't need this, so I'll use the control X shortcut to get rid of it. This will be using my UV coordinates. So I'll take this vector and I'll split it up. I'll use a separate XYZ node. Plug this in here. I'll use the X value for the factor here so we can see what this is doing. I'll look here. Remember what the UV coordinates are. They map pixels from a 2D plane to the 3D object, however it's been unwrapped. In the case of a square like this, it's a direct one-to-one -one mapping because the plane of the UV coordinates is exactly the same as the plane of the square. That's why going from zero to one in the X coordinate here is the same as going from zero to one in the U coordinate of the UV mapping. Now, all I have to do is to set these things how I would like. I can bring this over to here. I can add in another slider. I can bring this out to the side. I can set this to pure black. And now you can see on the ends of this thing, I have dark, white, and then dark again. What this will do is it'll give me a smooth gradient of light here. Let me bring these in. And now instead of a hard edge, I'll get softer ones. Let's just move this around. I can increase the strength to two. Bring this down, make it bigger, something like that. Now I can duplicate this. Now I can bring this over here. Let's go ahead and make this material unique for this plane. Now I can edit this shader without editing this one over here. So I can bring these out and I can move this around, something like that. Then when I'm all done, I can set this to indirect only and there. We now have a very nice looking lighting situation for this. It's not perfect, and of course I could sit here and play with this forever, but this will be good enough for the tutorial. All right, so I'm back in the Geometry Nodes Editor. Let me hit F12, get a nice render out of this. And that looks good to me. All right, I have a challenge for you. Looking at the Geometry Nodes here, you might notice that there aren't any options. We can change that. Looking at the Group Input node here, you can see there's an empty socket. We can connect this to just about anything. And if we do, all of a sudden, you'll see it shows up here. 
you will also notice that it shows up here. The value here is whatever it had been in the first place. Now, if I wanted to, I can change these numbers and the geometry updates. The last thing I'll mention is that this is just like any other data block in Blender. That is, we need to give this a name, so I'll call this rivets, and we'll protect it just like everything else. And if we want to use it again, you'll notice it shows up on this dropdown. So my challenge to you is to make your own node network that instead of just putting rivets here, is actually going to give you a circular array of whatever geometry you hand it. That is to say, it'll take the input geometry, it'll create an array that goes in a circle around it, and build whatever features you want into it, but make it so that you can control all of those features over here. And if you like, come join my Discord server and show me what you come up with. I would love to see it. But that's going to wrap up this episode. I know this wasn't as in-depth as my other videos. That is to say, there's actually still a lot you need to know about geometry nodes in order to really effectively use it. But the next part of this explanation was getting so long that I chopped it off and made it its own video. I'm currently working on it, and hopefully it'll be out soon. In the meantime, if you want to support me, go check out my Patreon page. But until next time, take care of yourselves, be good to each other, and I will see you in the next one.